You know what time it is. Woo! Get into it! Get into it! Yes! We are back! We are back with Storytime with Chris. Hi, y'all. I know I'm a little bit late this time, but I had a very, very long day at work and had a very informative and pivotal um, manager meeting that went a bit long, which is fine because great progress is made when great minds are allowed to have the freedom to think at length. So I do apologize for my tardiness. So I am here. And of course, as I always say, you're more than welcome to watch these in your spare time, in between time, nap time, relaxing time, chillaxing time, work time, sleepy time. Whatever you need to hear a highly animated voice bring you magical stories right to your home. And if you haven't done so already, like, share, and subscribe onto the YouTube channel. The link is within my bio as well as on my Instagram. So please go ahead, like, share, subscribe. It only takes less than three seconds. And no, I don't do this for profit. It allows me to get people excited and fall in love with the magic of literature. So if you have that time, I'd be most grateful. <clears throat> Actually, I also want to announce one other thing. So, I more than likely will read this Thursday evening. So, for those who are familiar with the story, it's called A Child's Christmas in Wales. Apparently, it's like a really well-known classic. The reason why I picked it up is because the artist and illustrator of the book is one of my favorites trina shart hyman it's one of my favorite illustrators of all time and i wish she was still on this earth because i would so hire her or somebody who could emulate her style because it just the way that she would paint and draw people and backgrounds made it seem like i don't know like i the best way to describe it, it, it looks like a painting, but at the same time, it gives so much detail to character faces and, and, and expression that you feel like you're watching real people on paper. It just, it's really great. I've read at least one of her children's books that she's illustrated on here for St. George's Day, which the story we read for that is St. George and the Dragon, which is one of my favorite fairy tales and Arthurian legends. But hold on one sec. I'm going to find it. Oh, no. <laughs> Hold on. Yeah. Meanwhile, the super friends were looking for the text. Hidden somewhere in the... Aha! There it is. If it was a snake, it would have bit me. It's okay. All right. There we go. Okay. Whew. No, there's always silly shenanigans on Storytime with Chris. So I'm going to show you an example of her artwork. It just... See, hopefully everybody can see. So like, it looks like a old school oil painting with a touch of realism art attached to it. It almost reminds me of like how Norman Rockwell would illustrate his... Um, newspaper covers and whatnot which um oh goodness i lost my train of thought i can't remember the magazine he used to illustrate for but if you don't know who norman rockwell is kids please look him up he was an incredible illustrator seriously ah, put you back and i will make a formal announcement after this reading of the black cauldron and of course i don't own the music that you're listening to in the background which is brought to you by Mr. Ambiance. Oh, and thank you for that like, whoever that was. I appreciate you. Mm. All right. Now, no more gushing. Let's go ahead and get into the story. 
because we're about to get into a very scary situation because the Huntsmen of Anuvin have arrived. And if you remember from the previous chapter, the Huntsmen are not the Cauldron Born. So the Cauldron Born are zombie warriors that can't be destroyed or killed. But the Huntsmen of Anuvin are mortal men who have sided with the Dark Lord Arorn and have pledged their allegiance to him. So whenever one of them falls in battle, the others that remain get stronger. And that's incredibly scary. It's like... <laughs> it's like having a food contest and when one person falls the other like say it's five people the four that are left they continue to try to you know eat more food than the other person and then another person falls and the three have to push 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 and then the third person falls and then the two that are left have to push 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 until there's one left and they're pretty much the winner of the task let's just say that so they just get continuously stronger so we're about to find out because uh princess Ilanwe and gurgi have um not spirited away they have stowed away on this quest when they weren't supposed to so we're gonna see what happens next all right chapter five the Huntsmen of Anuvin. The pack horses shrieked in terror. Melalas reared as arrows rattled among the branches. Fluter, sword in hand, spun his mount and plunged against the attackers. Adion's voice rang above the din. These are the Huntsmen. Fight free of them. At first it seemed to Tarin the shadows had sprung to life. Formless they drove against him, seeking to tear him from his saddle. He swung his sword blindly. Melalas pitched furiously, tried to break away from the press of warriors. The sky had begun to unravel in scarlet threads. The sun, rising against black pines <clears throat> and leafless trees, filled the grove with a baleful light. Taran now saw the attackers numbered about a dozen. They wore jackets and leggings of animal skins. Long knives were thrust into their belts, and from the neck of one warrior hung a curved hunting horn. <coughs> As the men swirled around him, Taran caught his breath in terror. Each huntsman bore a crimson brand on his forehead. The sight of it filled Taran with dread, for he knew the strange symbol must be a mark of Arorn's power. He fought against the fear that chilled his heart and drained his strength. Behind him, he heard Ilanwe cry out. Then he was seized by the belt and dragged from Melalas. A huntsman tumbled with him to the ground. Closely grappled, Tarn could not bring his sword into play. The huntsman raised himself abruptly and thrust a knee against Tarn's chest. The warrior's eyes glinted. He bared his teeth in a horrible grin. As he raised his dagger, the huntsman's voice froze in the midst of triumph, and he suddenly fell backward. Eladir, seeing Tarin's plight, had brought down his sword in one powerful blow. Thrusting the lifeless body aside, he heaved Tarin to his feet. For an instant, their eyes met. Eladir's face, below a blood-stained mat of tawny hair, held a look of scorn and pride. He seemed about to speak, but turned quickly without a word and ran toward the fray. In the grove, there was a sudden moment of silence. Then a long sigh rippled among the attackers as though each man had drawn breath. Tarin's heart sank as he remembered Gwydion's warning. With a roar, the huntsmen renewed their attack with great ferocity, dashing themselves against the struggling companions in a surge of fury. From astride, Melolas, Ilanwe fitted an arrow to her bow. Tarin hurried to her side. <clears throat> Do not slay them, he cried. Defend yourself, but do not slay them. Just then a hairy twiggy figure burst from the shrub. Gurgi had snatched up a sword nearly as tall as himself. His eyes shut tightly. He stamped his feet, shouted, and swung the weapon about him like a scythe. Furious as a hornet, he raced back and forth among the huntsmen, bobbing up and down, his blade never still. As the warriors sprang aside, Tarn saw one of them clutch the air and spin head over heels. Another huntsman doubled over and fell, pounded by invisible fists. He rolled across the ground in an attempt to escape the, buff the buffeting. But no sooner did he climb to his feet than a shouting, thrashing warrior was flung against him. The huntsmen lashed out with their weapons only to have them ripped from their hands and tossed into the shrub. Against this charge, they fell back in alarm. 
Dolly! Tarn cried. It's Dolly! Never underestimate a dwarf, children. They are powerful warriors for a reason. Just saying. Adion took this moment to plunge forward. He seized Gurgi and hoisted him to Luagor's back. Follow me! Adion shouted. He turned his mount and shot past the struggling warriors. Taran leapt to the back of Melilas with Ilanwe clinging to his belt. He bent low over the horse's silver mane. Arrows flew past him as Melilas streaked ahead. Then the stallion was clear of the grove and pounding across of open ground. Ears back, Melilas galloped past a line of trees. Dry leaves flew in a whirlwind beneath churning hooves as the stallion sped to the brown crest of a hill. For a moment, Tarn dared to glance behind him. Below, a number of huntsmen had separated from the band and with great strides held to the track of the fleeing companions. They were swift, even as Gwydion had warned. In their jackets of bristling skins, they seemed wild beasts rather than men as they spread in a wide arc across the slope. As they ran, they called out to one another in a weird wordless cry that echoed almost from the brooding crags of Dark Gate itself. Cold with dread, Tarn urged Melilas on. Clumps of grass rose high among fallen tree trunks and withered branches. Ahead, Luogor galloped down an embankment. Adion had brought them to a riverbed. Dark water lay in a few shallow pools, but for the most part it was dry and the clay banks rose high enough to offer concealment. Adion reined in Luogor and cast a quick glance behind him to make sure all had followed and beckoned the companions to move forward. They set off at a rapid gait. The riverbed would wound its way through high-standing firs and tattered alders, but after a little time the embankment fell away and a sparse forest became their only cover. Although Melon last did not slacken speed, Tarin saw the pace and began to tell on the other horses. Tarn himself longed to rest. Dolly, shaggy pony, labored through the trees. The bard had ridden his own mount into a lather. Elidir's face was deathly pale and he was bleeding heavily from his forehead. They had not, as far as Tarn could tell, stopped hastening westward, and Darkgate lay some distance behind them, though its peaks no longer could be seen. Tarin had hoped Adion could have fallen back toward the path they had used earlier with Gwydion, but he knew now they were far from it and traveling still farther. Adion led them to a dense thicket and signaled them to dismount. We dare not stay here. Long, he warned, there are few hiding places Aurorn's hunters will not discover. Then stand and face them, cried the bard. A flam never shrinks! Yes, yes, Gurgi will face them too, put in Gurgi, although he seemed barely able to lift his head. We shall stand against them only if we must, Adion said. They are stronger now than they were before and will not tire as quickly as we will. We shall make our stand now, Eladir cried. Is this the honor we gain from following Gwydion? To let ourselves be tracked down like animals, or do you fear them too much? I do not fear them, Tarn retorted. But it is no dishonor to shun them. This is what Gwydion himself would order. Ilanwe, though exhausted and disheveled, had not lost the use of her tongue. Oh, be quiet, both of you, she commanded. You worry so much about honor when you'd be better off thinking of a way to get back to Karakadarn. Tarn, who had been crouched against a tree, raised his head from his hands. From a distance came a long, wavering cry. Another voice answered it, then another. Are they giving up the hunt? he asked. Have we outrun them? Adion shook his head. I doubt it. They would not pursue us this far, only to let us escape. He swung stiffly to Luagor's back. We must ride until we find a safer place to rest. We would have little hope if we let them come upon us now. As Illidir strode to the weary Islomach, Tarn took him by the arm. You fought well, son of Penlaka, he said quietly. I think that I owe you my life. Elidir turned to him with the same glance of contempt Tarn had seen in the grove. It is a small debt, he replied. You value it more than I do. They set out once again, moving deeper into the forest. They, 
as rapidly as their strength allowed. The day had turned heavy with dampness and chill. The sun was feeble, wrapped in ragged gray clouds. Their progress slowed in the tangle of underbrush, and the wet leaves mired the struggling animals. Dolly, who had been bent over his saddle, straightened abruptly. He looked sharply around him. Whatever he saw caused him to be strangely elated. There are fair folk here, he declared as Tarn rode up beside him. Are you sure? Tarn asked. How do you know? Though he looked closely, he could see no difference between this stretch of forest and the one they had just passed through. How do I know? How do I know? snapped Dolly. How do you know how to swallow your dinner? He kicked his heels against the pony's flanks and hurried past Adion, who halted in surprise. Dolly jumped down and, after examining several trees, ran quickly to the ruins of an enormous hollow oak. He thrust his head inside and began shouting at the top of his voice. Tarin, too, dismounted with Ilanwe at his heels. He ran to the tree, fearful the fatigue and strain of the day had at last driven the dwarf out of his wits. <clears throat> Ridiculous, muttered Dolly, pulling his head out of the tree. I can't be that far wrong. He bent, siding along the ground and made incomprehensible calculations on his fingers. It must be, he cried. King Idleg wouldn't let things run down this badly. With that, he gave a number of furious kicks against the tree roots. Tarn was sure the angry dwarf would have climbed into the tree itself had the opening in the trunk been larger. I'll report it, Dolly cried. Yes, to Idleg himself. Unheard of. Impossible. I don't know what you're doing, Ilanwe said, brushing past the dwarf and stepping up to the oak. But if you tell us, we might be able to help you. As the dwarf had done, she peered into the hollow trunk. I don't know who's down there. <coughs> Excuse me, y'all. <laughs> Ilanwe was a bit tired after that battle. But we're up here, and Dolly wants to talk to you. At least you can answer. Do you hear me? Ilanwe turned away and shook her head. They're impolite, whoever they are. That's worse than somebody shutting their eyes so you can't see them. A faint but distant voice rose from the tree. Go away, it said. And that is where we will end for tonight. This is this is a fun series to read. I, I've read it several times in my youth, and I love that I get to share it with you all. So, I hope you all have a lovely night. I will see you all tomorrow. Be good. Bye-bye.